With the summer upon us, a lot of Ontarians are going to be experiencing flooding from rainstorms and sewer overflows in the months ahead. We thought we'd get you some advice on how to avoid that becoming a multi-thousand dollar headache. Barbara Robinson is president of Norton Engineering, but she's perhaps better known as the Sewer Lady. And she joins us now here in studio. Nice to see you back here again. You too, Steve. Generally speaking, how much do you think people know about the sewer system that we all very much depend on to keep things clean? Steve, I would say the average resident knows almost nothing about sewers. And this is a problem because the more residents know, the more they can help prevent and reduce uh, flooding for all of us. Why do you think we are so ignorant about it? Well, I guess I would say the, the people who concern themselves with sewers, the engineering people, um, generally don't uh, relate with the public all that much. They don't talk directly to the public, and it's kind of complex. So we, we need to give the public a chance to understand the things we ask them to do and why it's so important. And when you give them that information, how interested are they in getting it? Oh, good gravy. When I, I speak to service groups and universities, I speak constantly to people, and they are on the edge of their seats. I mean, people just don't Seriously. Know I have the lineups after I speak, and this is rotaries onto groups, just, you know, uh, just they're beside themselves. They just don't stop what you're doing. You, go, you have to educate more people, whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's really important. So we actually do want to know. It's just getting yes. there. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's consider some of the best practices we could implement to reduce flooding and the costs that come associated with that. And we want to start with reducing the amount of flow in our sewers or flooding our sewers. So let's start with this. What are roof leaders? <laughs> so roof leaders, are, we generally, are, we call them downspouts. Roof leaders is the technical term, whatever. So that, that's a, a pipe that connects the water from your roof uh, and uh, goes down into the sanitary sewer in some cases. Is it legal? It's illegal across Canada. Seriously? Yes. These are illegal to use. Yes. But we all use them. Yes. So here's the problem. They're kind of legal non -conform Well, they're not legal. They're illegal. But they mm. were legal when they were built, a lot of them back in the day. Houses before about 1985. They were legal before 1985, but all the houses since are illegal. But it is illegal today per every sewer use bylaw in Ontario and probably Canada. It's illegal in a sewer use bylaw. Why is it illegal? Because it's clean water. And sanitary sewers are supposed to convey sanitary sewage. Now, Toronto is an exception because you have combined sewers in some areas, mm -hmm. so the sanitary and the storm go into the same pipe. But it's the same which problem. Which is not great when we which get is too much not, rain. Which is not great. However, disconnecting your roof leader can help that immeasurably with that. So essentially, you are telling everybody watching this or listening to this right now, if you've got a roof leader on your house, take it apart. Correct. If you have a roof leader going into the ground right. and your house is older than about 1980, it's likely going into the sanitary sewer. And I'll tell you why. Because, you know, when a basement flood happens, there's a tipping point at which the, you know, hydraulic grade line in the sewer just gets that much higher and spills over, you know, into your house as a basement flood. If you even have your own roof leader connected, uh, pardon me, downspout connected, all the water from your roof, and you know how much rain is, yeah. there's a lot and it's flashy, gets into the pipe and that could just trigger a basement flood in at your house. But not that alone, if either of your neighbors on either side or depending on the hydraulics, even some people in your neighborhood are connected, that big whack of flow just ends up in the sanitary sewer and puts all of your neighbors and you at risk of flooding. Can we do this ourselves or do we need somebody to do it for us? No, you can do this yourself. It's simple. You take a hacksaw, you, you saw your downspout off like a foot above the ground, put an elbow and an extension. You want the extension to be long enough so it's well away from the wall of your house because you don't want the water going down your foundation wall. Right it can get into the weeping tiles and that's another problem so but so you know residents don't realize overflows to Lake Ontario particularly in combined sewers like Toronto mm -hmm. every single drop of connected water from your roof is a hundred percent part of the overflow of going to Lake Ontario so you know engineers on the public side have been working for years to reduce the leakage in the public side sewers but half of the leak half of the sewer the length of sewers in a sewer system actually is on the private side meaning owned by individual, owned by homeowners, yeah. not the city. And uh, municipalities across Canada, across North America, have been very loath to tackle this private side uh, drainage uh, contribution to flooding because they think people don't want to do it. And I'm saying people do want to do it. The people I, I talk to are just absolutely amazed. They didn't know about all these risks and all that. So people really want to help. And with climate change coming, 
some of the best practices I talk about, we can reduce the amount of flow in sewers by 15, 20, 30 percent today by just mm. fixing, improving what we've got, particularly on the private side, so that we've got all that room in the pipe now for the climate change that we're concerned about. That doesn't mean things are never going to flood. There's always risk of flood that we can't get away, get, get away from that risk. But so um, residents themselves can do a lot to help reduce this risk and, and save money. Uh, well, okay, so if everybody tomorrow did what you are recommending tonight, tell us how things would look different. Um, uh, I imagine we'd reduce uh, peaking flow by 30, 40 percent. Like that's, there's a lot of water going into sanitary sewers. So even in a separated sanitary sewer system like where I live, which means there's a sewer pipe and a, and a storm pipe separately, um, unless uh, the city has initiated a program to disconnect those roof leaders, a lot of them are going into the sanitary sewer. Uh, for separated systems, like 40, 50 percent of the water getting to the sewage treatment plant, of the flow getting to the sewage treatment plant is clean water. So rainwater or groundwater, it shouldn't be there. It's, it's, treatment plants are not supposed to be treating clean water. Hmm. Okay. Next thing, foundation drains. Are you finding people in newer homes are having them disconnected? Absolutely. So uh, homes built after 1985, because we didn't gravity connect to the sewer, so we weren't automatically connected, they were built with uh, sump pumps. So there's a, a, an area that where the water collects and you've got a sump pump that pumps it out um, to the surface or to a storm sewer or whatever. Um, people don't like dealing with pumps. People are afraid of pumps. It's also related to the sewage system and people are a bit um, loath to deal with sewage. And so um, it's frequently found that people with some pump connections are disconnecting them and uh, connecting the water by gravity to the sanitary sewer. Now, uh, weeping tiles from before 1985 are also connected to the sanitary sewer, so that's also a problem that we have to deal with eventually. Mm -hmm. But the immediate thing is those people who have, have um, disconnected their sump pump and redirected the flow by gravity to the sanitary sewer means all that water is also contributing to flooding directly and 100%. So um, one of the reasons people don't like uh, pumps is because they fail, they're afraid of them or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a sump pump, I understand why you might, might want to reconnect to gravity, but um, you're increasing your risk of flooding. Because if you hydraulically connect the sump pump to the sanitary sewer, when there's a sanitary sewer backup, it can get back into your house, whereas pump to surface can't. So you increase your risk of flooding by doing that. And it's and the reason I know this is because plumbers and building inspectors, I work with them constantly, tell me they frequently go into homes and find these things disconnected. Is that illegal as well? Absolutely. It's, it's illegal it's to do that. It's illegal to connect rain uh, round <laughs> rainwater or groundwater to the sanitary sewer across Canada. Hmm. Absolutely. What should we do about it? So same thing, if you have a disconnect, well, actually, uh, this is a little more difficult for residents to deal with because it's a more expensive solution. Disconnecting a roof leader is about a $50. You're going to buy an elbow on an extension. That's 50 mm -hmm. bucks. Anybody can do that. To disconnect um, uh, a sump pump, uh, and, uh, to disconnect the gravity connection and go back to a sump pump, mm -hmm. um, people don't want to do this. Um, my solution for this is... Every time a building inspector from the city goes to someone's house for any reason, mm -hmm. they should proactively go and check the basement plumbing. And if it's been illegally reconnected, the storm has been illegally reconnected to sanitary sewer, they take a picture, we'll need a database or whatever, and they follow up with an order to disconnect. Hmm. We're there, we have every power, we, we already have all these municipal, municipal powers already. We don't need any new laws, anything. We can, municipalities can start tomorrow doing these kinds of things. If, if the inspectors come around and they find that you have done these things that, that are, and maybe you didn't do them, maybe the person who had the house Perhaps, before you yeah. did, uh, is there a big fine involved or what, what can they do? What punishment can they inflict? Uh, well, municipalities can, through the municipal use bylaw, can can uh, issue an order and charge you any fee they want. I, I think they should charge you $10,000 <laughs> because uh, the cost to society and with climate change coming, all these connections are just making flooding worse and worse. So, yeah. and, and the other thing I'll just say about sump pumps is, you know, if you have a sump pump, uh, you want to be, a sump pump or a backwater valve, you want to be checking that. It's called protective plumbing equipment. It protects your basement from flooding. Mm -hmm. Spring and fall, when you check your smoke detectors and CO detectors, mm -hmm. check your sump pump and check your backwater valve. And when I say ch check your sump pump, make sure it's working. So either pull up on the float or fill it with water and see if the, float, uh, see if the pump engages. Mm -hmm. um, because th that way you'll know it's working. When the big storm comes, you're protected. Let, uh, let me do the math with you here. Uh... House fires, carbon dioxide poisoning, basement flooding. 
Which of those three happens most frequently? Basement flooding by a very, very, very long shot. And that's the one thing we actually check the least. We don't check it at all, exactly. And and it, it, people get PTSD now. It's they've done lots of studies. If you have a basement flood with sewage in your basement, I mean it's it's a disaster. People lose their possessions and they get PTSD. It's just a terrible thing. So yeah, the risk of of uh, dying in a fire. You know, we're not talking death with a basement flood, but it's still a serious thing and it's constant. I mean, places like Toronto and Hamilton with the old combined systems experience a lot of basement flooding. It's traumatic for people. So listen, we're doing public service announcements spring and fall. Uh, check your smoke and CO detectors. Let's say check your uh, protective plumbing equipment as well. Hmm. Okay, let's do, this is where we're really going to get into the uh, nitty gritty, into the, into the pipes here, okay? <laughs> a question on the notion that toilets are not, are not trash cans. Correct. Okay. How much of a problem is it for example, women going into the bathroom and they flush sanitary products down the toilet because there are no trash cans uh, or uh, either, you know, in the stall and therefore they have no choice. That's what they do. Correct. How much of that happens? Uh, Steve, this is constantly, this is happening constantly and, and I actually just discovered this, discovered, just realized a few, <laughs> a few months ago of all things. So per the building codes in Canada, women's stalls are not required to contain trash cans. Now, there's a trash can out by the sinks. Mm -hmm. If a woman... So 51% yeah. of the population is a, a female. Right. And I looked at our population demographic. About half of all women at any one time are menstruating. Uh, pardon me. Half of women are of menstrual age and 20% uh, are men menstruating at any one time. So uh, a woman's in a washroom stall and she's dealing with soiled materials, soiled hands. There's no trash can. There's no sink. There's nothing. Women's stalls look like men's stalls. They look the same. The only difference is we're provided with a flimsy paper bag that we're supposed to somehow get the product from where it is. So this is... This is this, for, for men who never go in women's washroom stalls, this is what's in women's washroom stalls. This flimsy paper bag. It looks like it leaks. Um, I've been doing a survey with women since uh, I realized that this wasn't in the building code. I've never seen, nobody has ever seen a woman walk out of a stall with one of these in their hand, was sort of soiled or whatever. It's, it, we just don't do it. So this is what's been provided in the building codes. Now, the building codes were written 60 years ago and they were written by men. So, so the thing is we need today, I mean, tomorrow, I would like municipalities to start putting trash cans in all of women's washroom stalls. So we have a place to put these materials without you know, we, we can't get this material on our clothing or whatever, so we need something right there that we can use to dispose of it. So a lot of private, um, like restaurants and stuff, often have a trash can because uh, the plumbing calls from flushing this sort of thing are, are they're, they're constant. Um, and the other thing is, again, I, as, we, uh, as we started when we spoke, um, People don't realize how important it is to not flush the stuff because we're not really telling them. Well, let, let's go through the implications yeah, yeah, of that. Yeah, absolutely. If, if a lot of these materials get flushed down the toilet, take us down the road. What happens? Absolutely. So, um, uh, flushable wipes are actually the worst and they're, they're new. They have plastic in them. But any anything uh, that doesn't break down in a sewer um, is a place to attract fat, soil, and grease. And fat, soil, and grease are naturally discharged because we are what we eat and so that's normal in sewers. Um, it gives these, the, these um, chunky things a place to stick. So we've started to see fatbergs in sewer systems a lot. And fatbergs are literally all this chunky stuff, not just sanitary products, flushable wipes, dental floss, all the things that are not supposed to go in sewers. They stick with the fat, soil, and grease and, and build up. And there was a fatberg in London, England, uh, five or six years ago. It was the size of a city bus. <laughs> and these block the sewers. They cause basement flooding, whatever. And the only way to get rid of a fatberg is for men to go, I say men because I've, I've, I've never had to do it myself, but they have to manually chip the fatberg apart with pickaxes and haul mm. it out of there. It's just... Not fun. Ugh. Um, so, uh, you know, people people just don't realize. So uh, flushable wipes, I'll just talk about that. The term flushable simply means it can pass through your toilet trap. It can flush. It doesn't mean it's okay in sewers. In so, fact, it's not okay. It is absolutely. Flushable wipes it. have plastic in them. They should never, ever, ever be flushed. So um, the things you can flush in order of safety, single-ply toilet paper, two-ply toilet paper, 
After that, I'm not very happy. Three-ply toilet paper, Kleenex, paper towel, dental floss, sanitary products, diapers, and the, these things clog sewers. And they, here's the thing. When you flush that down your own sewer at home, um, your own sewer, uh, if you live in a house that's 80 years old, your sewer is 80 years old. And even in new sewers, uh, in, in new homes, sometimes the sewers aren't in, in as good condition as, as they should be. So this stuff can easily block. And if you've got other problems in your sewer, this fat, soil, and grease and all that can block your sewer and cause a basement flood on your own. So even in your home, you never want to d- discharge any of that stuff. And the other thing is in the kitchen, no fat soils and grease down the drain. Down the drain. Yeah. So people, I don't know if people do it anymore, I can't imagine, but I know people used to make bacon and pour that liquid bacon grease down the sink. Now, when you make, when the bacon grease is hot, it's liquid. As soon as it gets to the bottom, uh, to your sewer, which is underneath your, underneath your floor slab, it solidifies. <laughs> and when plumbers do calls and, and there's blockages, they constantly say, well, you, you had a big fat bird down there, it was full of this, full of that, full of trash, mm-hmm. full of... So um, residents not only are keeping this stuff out of away from pump stations and sewage treatment plants, but they're protecting their own property from flooding. Why are they allowed to call them flushable wipes if they're not flushable? Here's the thing. The term flushable technically means it can pass through your toilet, but the average resident doesn't know that. So my industry, not me personally, but my industry across North America has been uh, fighting the flush, flushable wipes in, industry for quite some time. That's not a, It's not fair to use that term on these products because they're, they're not flushable. Got it. So the other thing about flushing all these things, and, and women's washrooms without trash cans, women are away from the home, what, 12 hours a day? Mm-hmm. That's 12 hours a day. They're necessarily flushing these products because we have no choice. In places like Toronto that have combined sewer overflows and Lake Ontario ends up full of menstrual products and all that stuff, it's just an unsightly mess. The reason that's happening, Steve, a big reason is because women have no choice during the day at work, wherever they are, without trash cans, we're flushing, we have no choice, and it ends up in Lake Ontario. So if municipalities would put trash cans, require trash cans uh, in in every stall so women had a chance to get rid of these things, it's still a bit problematic getting the product to the trash can, to, to be honest, but we would reduce that load at the uh, during overflows, but also the load at the sewage treatment plant because when all this stuff gets to the sewage treatment plant, it gets screened out with screens or whatever, they have to take those screenings, dump them in trucks and drive them to the landfill and then put mm-hmm. them in the landfill. So we don't want this stuff in the public side system, we don't want it at pump stations and we don't want it in women's washroom stalls. Have you lobbied City Hall for these changes? I lobby relentlessly, it's all I do, Steve. <laughs> and do they not listen? Well, you know, I, actually the women's, the trash cans and women's stalls, I just figured out a, a few months ago, so I'm lobbying hard now huh. because this 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 is a game changer. Okay, you've got a visual yeah, aid here. That- yeah, so, so I just, because these don't exist, I just made up this little sign. Uh, again, this this whole point about the fact that things go to the, have to be screened out at the wastewater treatment plant, I mean, no one knows that, no it's one just understands. It's just the three Ps you want. Pee, poo, and paper. That's all that goes down. Pee, poo, and paper. Uh, and, and, and your kitchen sink, you know, if you make bacon, use a paper towel, wipe it out, put the white paper towel in your composting, right. whatever. Nothing but, it, just think about, you don't want anything that could uh, block your sewer or the, or the public sewer. So you, these do not exist. You just made this I up. I just made these up because they don't exist. That's but correct. But they... Could and perhaps should go in every. I would like these signs in every in on the back of every uh, stall in mm. Canada, including men's stalls, because men are starting to flush flushable wipes. And the advantage of putting them on the back of a toilet stall is you have undivided attention. You have people's <laughs> undivided attention. That is true. No, I'm serious. We we mm. we do talk about these things. I mean, most municipalities don't give the information about why, but sometimes there are bill inserts and stuff. And you know, municipalities are trying to do all these things, but. People don't write, read bill inserts, or at least it's not changing behavior. So, and as, as pardon me, I should have said earlier. As far as roof leader disconnection goes, there are municipalities working on that. In, in Toronto, it's currently illegal. I, I mean, they they are are uh, it's mandatory now to disconnect roof leaders. But I don't know the up. T- it's always hard to get uptake from residents or whatever because they really don't want to do these things. But just if residents would understand, if we would disconnect these roof leaders, we'd reduce flooding risk for everybody. And if it becomes kind of socially unacceptable, if you see your neighbor with roof leaders going into the ground, you, you shouldn't be thinking, geez, that could cause a flood at my house or whatever. So, um, uh, you know, as a society, these are things that need to change. As they say on the TTC, if you see something, say something. If you see something, say something. There we go. Absolutely. The sewer lady strikes again. <laughs> Barbara Robinson from Norton Engineering, thanks so much for coming in tonight. It's thank, been great. Thank you for having me, Steve. Always a pleasure.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.